Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 through 17. Whoever strikes a person so that he dies must be put to death. But if he didn't intend any harm, and yet <laughs> Elohim caused it to happen by his hand, I will appoint a place for you where he may flee. If a person willfully acts against his neighbor to murder him by scheming, you must take him from my altar to be put to death. Whoever strikes his father or his mother must be put to death. Whoever kidnaps a person must be put to death. Whether he sells him or the person is found in his possession, whoever curses his father or his mother must be put to death. In my last sermon, I talked about the concept of capital punishment based on the first text here that we just read where Yahweh says that a person who commits certain crimes must be put to death. In order for there to be peace in a county or a state or a country, there must be laws. And in order for those laws to be of complete value, there must be penalties for breaking or violating those laws. But when it comes to the ultimate penalty of someone having to forfeit their life due to a heinous crime, how does government or civil authority carry out these penalties. They are to be carried out, but there are parameters that are involved. I thought, after I taught that last lesson, I knew there would be one or two more lessons I would teach on capital punishment before we <coughs> went into the various commands and penalties mentioned in the text that we read. I thought about a few ways that I could go about teaching this lesson, but what I decided to do was exegete a text in the Newer Testament in the Gospels in John chapter 8, specifically verses 2 through 11, where we have the account of a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. This is a text that's often cited as proof that Yeshua did away with the death penalty for crimes that called for such. So the Old Testament taught the death penalty, but Yeshua overturned that in his ministry. I want to show you why this is not the case. And as we walk through this text, you will also learn about the proper parameters that must be met and followed in order to carry out this must-be-put-to-death clause in Exodus. So we're going to begin reading today in John 8, 2 through 5. I have all of the scriptures on the screen today. You're more than welcome to follow me in your own Bible. John 8, 2 through 5. At dawn, he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moshe commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? So they bring this woman up to the Master, to the Messiah, and she's standing right in front of everyone there, and they tell Yeshua, this one was caught committing adultery. Well, adultery is defined primarily in the Torah as sleeping with another man's wife. We find this in Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Now, other than the Ten Commandments, first given in Exodus 21 through 17, the second time given in Deuteronomy chapter 5, other than those two uses of adultery, which is the seventh commandment in the ten, this text, Leviticus 20 verse 10, is the only text in the law that talks about adultery by name. And we see here not only the definition for adultery, but also the penalty that is attached to this sin. We see it here, must be put to death. It's the same clause found in Exodus 21, 12 through 17 for those criminal acts. I want to make a note here, and if you write in your Bible, you can make a note at Leviticus 20.10 referring you to Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. There, that law, this law right here, is reiterated, but it's just not called adultery in that text. So the Pharisees, they say to Yeshua, in the law, Moshe commanded us to stone such women. Now remember, quickly, Moshe is used here because he's the man that Yahweh spoke directly and personally to. Remember at the end of Exodus 20, the people said, let not Elohim speak to us because we're going to die. So then Moshe goes and he gets the word from Yahweh and relays it to the people. That's why the law is often called the law of Moshe in Holy Scripture. It's okay to call it that. There's nothing wrong with calling it that. I would encourage you when you talk 
and witness about the Torah that you call it the law of Moses because I think we need to get that verbiage back into action. It's a very scriptural way of speaking. It's a way that all of the prophets and even our Messiah spoke. There's nothing wrong with saying the law of Moses. So we'll get more here about the stoning. We'll get more into that in a later lesson where I talk about the methods that Yahweh prescribed for putting a criminal to death. Um, but these men here knew the law, and they say in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Well, what I want you to notice now is that in Leviticus 20, verse 10, the penalty is not just death for the adulteress, the woman, but also the adulterer, the man. When a married woman commits adultery, she is not the only one involved in the sinful act. The man who took his neighbor's wife is just as involved and guilty. And both, according to the law, are to be punished. Not just the woman, not just the man, but both. Well, how does that play into John 8, 2 through 5? Well, notice that the scribes and the Pharisees only brought the woman. She was caught, they say, in the very act of adultery, which means, if they were telling the truth, that the man was caught as well, but he was not brought. Brothers and sisters, that's unjust weights and measures. You can't just punish the adulteress. You have to also punish the adulterer. So this is the first misuse or abuse of the law to point out by these scribes and Pharisees they were not interested in justice, and we know that because they only brought the adulteress to be punished. They must have had ulterior motives in bringing this woman to Yeshua, and I don't just say that as conjecture. I say that because the very next verse in John 8, verse 6a says, they asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Now we see their motive. It was a bad motive. And if you don't understand this point in the text, you'll misinterpret and misunderstand the rest of the text. The whole reason they brought the woman to him was not because they loved Yahweh's law. It was not because they wanted justice for Yahweh's law, that it had been violated. Had they really wanted justice, at the very least, they would have brought both the man and the woman that were guilty of the crime. You know why they brought the woman? Because they were upset because Yeshua was stirring the pot in the communities of Israel all around the land. So they wanted to trap him, accuse him, and eventually they wanted to kill him or murder him. When all of my children were little, one of them would sometimes come up to me and do what we call tattletale on their brother or sister. And I would always listen, but I would always question them about what happened. And I'd usually find out that somebody had been provoking somebody else to anger and then the somebody else got mad and decided to retaliate against the first somebody. <laughs> so when they came, on, came up to me to tattletale about their brother or their sister, what they wanted was they wanted me to punish their sibling, but they didn't want me to know about what they had done wrong to begin the, the fight or the argument. Sometimes we approach situations with wrong motives, with impure motives. We should not do that. Obviously, we have to teach children the right and the wrong ways in life as good parents bringing them up. But here we have some adults that bring this woman that had impure motives. Tattletailing on a woman, not worried about the man that was in the sin. And really, we're going to see they had problems themselves. The proper understanding here begins by realizing the Pharisees' motives were impure. They'd been bad boys themselves. They were just trying to trap or trick Yeshua. Thankfully, our master is smarter than a Pharisee. Amen. You've heard of that show, Smarter Amen. Than a Fifth Grader. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Well, Yeshua is smarter than a Pharisee. Do you think that the Messiah knew the law of Leviticus 20, verse 10? Mm. Well, of course he did. He knew that law. He knew you couldn't just condemn the adulteress. He knew the adulterer of the male must be condemned as well. So what does he do? John 8, 6 B says, Yeshua stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. Now, I've heard all kinds of ideas about what Yeshua wrote down. Some commentators say that this act resembles the act of the high priest in Numbers 5 where some dirt from the tabernacle floor was mixed with holy water for a woman who was suspicioned to have been promiscuous to drink. Eh, I mean, it's possible, but, you know, the text doesn't say... Some say Yeshua may have written some of the names of the Pharisees who stood around him, hinting that they were guilty of the same or similar sins. 
Eh, the text doesn't say. <laughs> Others say he may have written, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I heard a Messianic Jewish man one time say he was almost 100% certain that what Yeshua wrote was, Thou shalt not commit adultery, because it was a jab against the men who were standing there who were guilty of the same or similar sins. But the text doesn't say Still others say he was just ignoring them and that he was teaching the crowds and when they came, he ignored them and just continued to write something about what he was teaching prior to that moment. Kind of like saying, you're wasting my time with your tricks. I know what you're doing. But the fact is, is that we don't know what Yeshua wrote in the sand because the text doesn't tell us. It is neat to speculate and discuss what he might have written, but we should never be dogmatic about something that the text doesn't specify. Okay? Look at John 8, 7 through 8. This is where Yeshua uses his wisdom and he combines two wise sayings. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. So he tells them to stone her, but he's tricky because he combines that phrase with another phrase, the one without sin among you. He already knows what's going on is unjust. The man, the adulterer is not there. It's unjust. So in his wisdom, he uses two phrases. By saying, throw a stone at her, they could not then accuse him of ignoring the law of Moshe. But by adding to that phrase, the one without sin among you do this, he challenged the hearts, the motives, and the lives of the men. Our Messiah is extremely wise. The wisest man actually to ever walk the face of the earth. So John 8 verse 9 says this, When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. Why did they leave? Conviction. Conviction is why they left. There's no other reason for them to walk away after they're so dogmatic, saying we caught this woman in the very act. But when Yeshua says, let the one who is without sin throw the first stone, they walk away. They must have been guilty of the same or similar sin, which meant they too deserved to be stoned if they had been caught in the very act. As impure as they were being, their consciences still convicted them of what they were guilty of and what they were trying to do. The scripture does teach that even unbelievers, if these Pharisees were just going through the motions and may have been unbelievers, I think it's in the book of Romans, that even unbelievers have some kind of general revelation in their mind and their heart about what's right and what's wrong. It's not as good as specific revelation like Israel was giving, but just general revelation. There's a creator. I know some things are right and some things are wrong. So even if these Pharisees were unbelievers, they knew, hey, hmm, Ah, I see what he's saying. I see what he's saying. Now, there is nothing in the law that says a person must be sinless completely in order to carry out the death penalty on someone else. Mm -hmm. We find there are specifically two cases in the Torah, and I say Torah here meaning the Pentateuch, the first five books of Scripture. There's one case in Numbers 15 where we have recorded there was a man that was stoned for high-handed violation against Shabbat. And in Leviticus 24, there's another case where uh, the son of an Israelite woman was stoned for blasphemy in public. And so we know that the people who threw stones weren't sinless. They may have been pious and devout. They weren't completely without sin, but they still threw stones to punish these violators, these violators that acted criminally publicly in the community. So you don't have to be completely sinless in order to carry out the death penalty. However, think about this. A person who is privately guilty of a capital crime will think long and hard before condemning and putting to death another person who is publicly guilty of that crime. There are a lot of people that go free in the world that commit capital crimes because they do it in private and not in public, but yet they're still guilty. They may not get punished while on the earth, but if they do not repent before judgment day, Yahweh will punish the unrepentant. And so that's what these men were probably thinking in their minds. They're going through all of this. The judge of all the earth will eventually punish us even though we've been doing our sins in private. We haven't been caught in the very act yet. Now here's where we begin to learn a few more parts of properly carrying out the Torah's death penalty on a criminal. The woman's accusers all left. When Yeshua 
started back to write in the sand, and he said, let the one without sin throw the first stone. They all left. So there was no longer anyone who had been an eyewitness to her sin or her crime that was there. It was just the crowd and then Yeshua and the woman standing there at the center. Now that's significant if we know the Torah and we want to follow all of it. We can't pick and choose. It's not like going go to Golden Corral where you can pick one thing and leave the other to the side. That's not the Torah. You have to believe all of it. We have to practice all of it to the best of our ability. And in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says, One witness, echad, one witness cannot establish any wrongdoing or sin against a person, whatever that person has done. A fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 7 says this, The one condemned to die is to be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses no one is to be executed on the testimony of a single witness. The witness's hands are to be the first in putting him to death, and after that, the hands of all the people. You must purge the evil from you. So in the Torah, not only did you need at least two witnesses to accuse someone of a criminal act and then have them put to death, the eyewitnesses that saw the act taking place had to be the first ones who picked up the stones and carried out the judgment of Yahweh upon the criminal. Only then could the rest of the community participate in carrying out the penalty. Evil must be purged, as it says at the end of Deuteronomy 17, verse 7, but evil can only be purged by the standard that Yahweh has set in His law. You have to follow all of the parameters. We call it nowadays due process of law. Now, I'm not saying everything that our nation calls due process is proper due process. But I'm saying we call it due process of law where a person is innocent until proven guilty. And that is what Yahweh is teaching here with the eyewitness laws. Why eyewitnesses? Well, this is both the wisdom of Yahweh, and I want you to catch this, it's also the mercy of Yahweh. People think that the God of the Old Testament wasn't merciful, and I can disprove that on so many pages of the Older Testament that it's funny that that's even come to be a belief amongst people. I really think it's because people don't read the Bible. I, I really think that's the problem. I think that goes for a lot of churchgoers. I think Christians don't read the Bible. I think other people have never read the Bible. But we see that Yahweh is merciful in the Older Testament. It is easy for one person to rise up and claim that somebody committed a, a crime. A capital crime. It is more difficult to get two or three or four or five people to rise up and say that a person committed a capital crime. It is even more difficult than that to get two or three people's testimony to agree with each other. See, this is the wisdom of Yahweh. One of the best ways to determine if people are conniving with each other in a lie is to separate them and question each of them alone. Even if they're trying to falsely testify against somebody, if you can get them in a room by themselves and question them, you can see whether or not they are, are conniving to lie on this person that they're, they're trying to accuse of a crime. You can, can examine storylines, pertinent points. You can't do that with a single witness. You can't do it. So Yahweh is so merciful. Catch this. Yahweh is so merciful with his eyewitness law that he sometimes lets a guilty person go free here on the earth in order to protect an innocent person from being falsely accused by a single witness. That's the beauty of two or more witnesses in Scripture. A person can be guilty of a crime if there's only one witness. But Yahweh says you can't put him to death. Why? Because it could be a trick. You've got to have more evidence than a single witness. So the guilty man sometimes, or woman sometimes, goes free so that an innocent person can be protected. So without one, the adulterer, the male party there, and two, no eyewitnesses to the crime, Yeshua could not lawfully command the earthly death penalty on this woman. Yes, Yeshua showed this woman mercy. He did. Somebody said, didn't Jesus show her mercy? Somebody asked me that this week. I said, yes, he did, but he only showed mercy within the confines that the law allowed him to show mercy. See? In John 8, 10 through 11, we read this. When Yeshua stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? 
No one, Master, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Yeshua. Go from now on and do not sin anymore. Now I want you to notice this. The woman was guilty. We know this because Yeshua said, go and sin no more. She was guilty. Prophets, Yeshua was a prophet. He wasn't only a prophet, but he was a prophet. Prophets could know the, the thoughts and the intentions and what people had done. We see this all through the, the Holy Scriptures. And he knew that she was guilty, but he could not carry out the penalty that the Torah prescribed because all the puzzle pieces weren't there for a lawful execution. So that's why he doesn't condemn her. When he says, neither do I condemn you, he's not talking about you're not guilty. He's saying, I, don't, I can't condemn you to an earthly death penalty because the parameters haven't been met. But he knew she was guilty, and he said, from now on, do not sin anymore. Showing that we are supposed to repent, and we can sin less. I tell people we may not can be sinless without sin in this life, but I do believe we can sin less and less and less. It's dependent upon how serious we are with the Creator and how much time we've devoted to prayer, Bible study, fasting, and to, to Almighty Yahweh. If we keep our mind and our heart on Him, I promise you, you'll sin less than you do if you don't keep your mind and your heart on Yahweh. I promise you that. So, get this. Even when biblical capital punishment is in place in a community, there are still times when people are shown mercy because due process of law must be strictly followed. If all the parameters are met, the death penalty can and should be carried out. But still, even in a community where the death penalty is in place for such crimes, there's still going to be times when guilty people go free because of lack of eyewitnesses, because of lack of the parameters of the law, both people being brought, so forth and so on. Yahweh is still so merciful um, to allow that to, to take place. In our country today, um, adultery specifically, um, a man laying with another man's wife, it's really not even looked upon as really taboo anymore. That's right. That's right. Um, there's no penalty involved. You know what people do? They just get divorced. And uh, I think that it's lawful for a person to divorce in cases of, of adultery where that's happened. That's fine. But the problem is, is that people who are guilty of that criminal act, they just go about and live their own lives like it never happened. That's, that's awful. That's awful. So it used to be, in our country, it used to kind of be taboo, but it's, it's kind of, we've gotten away from that, and it's, it's very sad. Very, very sad. It doesn't matter how common it gets. It's still a transgression of Yahweh's law. The seventh commandment still says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. doesn't matter what the world says. doesn't matter how many people do it. Doesn't matter. doesn't matter how popular it becomes. Yahweh still says, It's wrong. You shouldn't do it. But, if all the parameters are met, everything in the law is followed, and the government has due process of law, and everything's carried out. The penalty must be carried out. Deuteronomy 19.21 says this. Look at this. You must not show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. All of those clauses after you must not show pity basically are saying the punishment must fit the crime. The way we know if we have a proper punishment fitting a crime is by what Almighty Yahweh says. Not by what Matthew says, not by what you says, not by what any king says. Only by what Yahweh Almighty says. At least we have a standard to follow. I ask people when they argue with me about things like this, what standard are you going by? Do you just make it up as you go along? How do you know what's right from wrong? How can you tell what's good and what's bad? They don't have a standard. They never have an answer. We have a standard to go by. It's the law of Yahweh. It's forever settled in heaven. The word of Yahweh is forever settled in heaven. Yes, People are downplaying the Bible now. Christians are downplaying the Bible now in progressive Christianity. Like, I don't follow the Bible. I just love Jesus. No, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. When Yeshua was tempted by Satan himself, he went to Holy Scripture. He went to Holy Scripture. He didn't say, I just feel good in my heart or I feel good about myself or I am who I am. He said, no, it's written. It's written. It's written. That's how he defeated Satan. That's how we defeat Satan. I want to encourage you now, because I'll, I'll calm a little bit down. I get excited. <laughs> but I want to encourage you now that Brother TJ, he taught a phenomenal, one of the best sermons I've ever heard. 
taught at the end of Ephesians where it talks about one of the, the armaments for the soldier is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Go back and listen to that. You can listen to it online or watch it on YouTube. It is an excellent, excellent teaching about the sufficiency of Scripture. It's so important. Thy word have I hid in my heart. This is precious to me. Yeah. Not because I bought it at Lifeway. Not because it's leather bound. It's precious to me because I really believe that the words inside of it are breathed out by Elohim. That's right. And they're given for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul wrote to young Timothy. So it's so important. And the word here says that in cases where the parameters have been followed, here's a case where you must not show pity. That's hard for Matthew because I like to be a merciful person. But there's certain times where you must not show pity. I know I teach a lot about mercy and I, Yahweh is merciful. He has not punished us as our sins deserve. He has not repaid us according to our wrongs. But there are cases where you must not show pity. Yahweh, catch this, Yahweh has let way more guilty people go free than be put to death. I mean, we have in our case in our nation now where there's a lot of sins that Yahweh considers capital crimes, like I said, adultery is one of them, that our nation just gives you a slap on the wrist, right? No big deal. Just go to the uh, courthouse or whatever and sign a piece of paper and boom, we'll just be divorced and we won't worry about it and the guilty party just goes free, maybe to commit the sin again at one point in time in the future. Well, Yahweh, what can I say? He's merciful. He's merciful. He's aware of all those crimes with his sovereign eyes in heaven. Proverbs 15, his eyes go to and fro about the earth. He beholds the evil and the good. So he knows. But when his law is enforced in society and all the parameters are in place, you must not show pity, he says. It is not merciful to a society to allow a murderer or a rapist to go free. You might say we've got, we got to show mercy on the person, but it's not merciful to the community. It's not. We have to show mercy on the community and mercy upon the family of the victim. Proverbs 21.15 says, Justice executed is a joy to the righteous, but a terror to those who practice iniquity. The reason this brings about peace in society, these laws, capital punishment laws, is because even a stone-cold heart of a wicked man is slowed down when he knows he'll face death if he's caught. A thief, which thievery is not as bad of a crime as murder, kidnapping, or anything like that. Thief, thievery uh, requires restitution. We'll eventually get to that. But even a thief who's hell-bent on stealing, if he absolutely thinks he's going to get caught, they'll say, abort, abort, abort. <laughs> we don't want to commit this crime because, look, there's too many cops around. There's too much chance that we're going to get caught, so we'll stop. I guarantee if they had to start paying double, triple, or fourfold, or sometimes sevenfold, it'd be even more of a deterrent to the crime. And if murderers that were proven to be murderers were put to death swiftly and the judgment of Yahweh was executed, I guarantee you there wouldn't be as much murder going on in the nation. It may not stop it wholesale, but it absolutely would slow it down. Absolutely. Deuteronomy 19 verse 20 says this, Then everyone else will hear and be afraid. And they will never again do anything evil like this among you. People say capital punishment isn't a deterrent to crime. Well, Yahweh says that it is. And I can guarantee you this. When a murderer or a rapist is executed, they will never commit murder or rape again. Amen. So it does deter crime. Now, I'm going to end today by reminding you. I end with this on purpose because I want to remind you. I do not teach these lessons because I want to see people die. I'm not this bloodthirsty man that wants to see people get executed. I don't. I would love for everybody to be law-abiding citizens. I would love for wicked people to repent and live. He always says in Ezekiel 18, he would rather somebody repent and serve him than to die in their sin. And I'm like Yahweh in that regard. I want that too. But the fact remains that men are sinners. And when big criminal sins are committed... The strong arm of the law is in place to make the community a safe space for law-abiding citizens. 
Do y'all remember when I was teaching through Galatians, I taught about the three uses of the law? Three uses of the law. One of them was as a curb. Remember, like a curb keeps you on the road. A curb here in the case means that we curb evil in a society. That's one of the three uses of the law. It's not to convict. It's not anything about a mirror. It's not anything about a guide. It's just that some people are evil and the law curbs evil. It may not stop it wholesale, but it slows it down and it keeps everything in line. We've got to keep the community as a safe space. And no matter where you live, this is believed to some extent by the leaders of the community. You know why? Because everybody has laws and everybody has some kind of penalty for violating those laws. I'm just suggesting that Yahweh knows best and we should go by what Yahweh says. That's what I'm suggesting. So next week I'll talk about the objection uh, given by some that these death penalty regulations are only for the nation of Israel inside the land of Israel. I strongly disagree with that, and I intend to prove why that is incorrect in my next lesson. That will be next week, Yahweh's will. For now, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what God tells you to do so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what God tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. May Yahweh bless you. Shalom.